Anka, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. As Hannah said, my name is Anka Gurzu. I'm based in Brussels. I'm the EU correspondent for Cypher by Breakthrough Energy, where we cover the intersection of climate and technology. So we just heard in the previous uh, sessions about what it takes to build a carbon removal technology like DAC and the, the process that's, that's involved in it. And we also uh, heard about the momentum in the industry right now and what's at stake. So we know that carbon removal technologies are in the spotlight this year. So to prepare ourselves for the rest of the day and the uh, rest of the summit uh, discussions that will take place, we will take a bit of a step back right now and, and take a bit of the pulse, let's say, of the industry and discuss the state of the carbon dioxide uh, removal options out there. So for that, I'm going to uh, welcome on stage our uh, three panelists to join me. Uh, we have Julio Friedman. He's a chief scientist at Carbon Direct. We have Erin Burns, CEO of Carbon 180, and Greg Nemet, professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Please join me. Have a seat. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we'll have an opportunity now to unpack some of the things that, that you heard were mentioned in the previous sessions. And I thought maybe one spicy way to start this panel discussion, uh, let's say, is to discuss something that has ruffled a bit some feathers in the last week um, in, the, in the carbon uh, dioxide removal community. And experts in the room and perhaps people watching online know what I'm talking about. It is a controversy around the draft assessment from a advisory body um, of the UN who described in a draft uh, version that a carbon uh, engineered carbon removal tech is, quote, technologically and economically unproven. And obviously, this has uh, provoked a strong response um, from the industry. And I think we're getting a bit of a sense of some of the nuances and um, how we got there. However, I do think. Um, it's important to, to get a reaction to that, to, to see what that reflects um, in terms of uh, the, the debate that's going on right now. And I would like to start with um, Aaron and maybe get your reaction to that and also um, if you can tell us a bit more um, um, of what, what you do and how that kind of uh, weaves in into this discussion. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, can I... I, when we were doing our prep call, I asked if I was allowed to disagree and say slightly controversial things. My personal, not official Carbon 180 take is that honestly, one of the things that for me, seeing that controversy and the response from the sector, it was kind of exciting because, Julia, you remember this, but I remember when it was getting them to talk about carbon removal at all. It was that it's not the same as solar geoengineering. Um, and the fact that there's like a sector to respond. I don't know. You know, Carbon 180 started in 2015. My former colleagues, Noah and Gianna, who are both here today, uh, started at a time when people, you know, they called it carbon renewal. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, one of the perspectives I had in the work that we do, which candidly is focused on US federal policy, and so, you know, we don't spend a lot of time at the sort of UN level anymore, was one, too, of like, a moment where we could say at Carbon 180, we focus on US federal policy because there was such a really robust response. I will say one, one thing that did align with our work that we were really focused on and thinking about how we responded, you know, we did put a little bit of information about where the sector landed in our newsletter. And one of the things that, that does intersect with what we're focused on is really setting high quality standards. And I think that's something that's really important as we talk about creating a proven industry, creating one that is viable, that we have to think about what are high quality standards and making sure that we're doing carbon removal really well. Thanks. And, and Julio, what's your take on this uh, controversy? Um, uh, it's hard to be charitable about the UNFCCC's post. Um, this weekend in Bonn, it was a topic of substantial discussion, and it already seems like the UNFCCC is walking back mm. that particular document. Um, uh, it's not clear that it followed UNFCCC process, among other things. And so they're revisiting this. They have actually extended the comment period another two weeks for people to weigh in. Like Aaron, I was delighted 
by the response of a big, broad community, 110 comments or more coming back. One of the more uh, feisty comments I thought actually came from developing nations mm -hmm. that said, excuse me, are you going to cut off our revenue streams already? Which I thought was a useful point to make. Countries like Kenya and Uruguay and uh, Indonesia and uh, India are actually looking in Brazil, they're building plants, they're commissioning these plants now. I also think it was rather noteworthy that the UNFCCC note that came out, packed with errors and questionable things as it was, came out the same day that Microsoft spent $500 million buying 2.7 million tons of CO2 removal from a BEX plant that was built and operating already, that was already capturing and storing CO2 in the North Sea. So. Um, I believe that this will prove, uh, I'd love to get Greg's thoughts on this too, uh, that actually uh, there will already be substantially strong response to this in a way that will, in fact, liberate more opportunities around Article 6.4 uh, that will strengthen desire to do things under Article 6.2. I think we're going to actually see more exchange, more bilateral, more multinational action, and more investment as a consequence of this note. So what I'm hearing is that, yes, it wasn't like the, the right thing that came out, but the discussion that followed was very beneficial in a, in a way. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, spicy, encouraging, but to me still puzzling because, you know, I spent the last three or four years working with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the word that we use for carbon removal that was not only coming from the 200 or so scientists, for from, but from 193 countries, was unavoidable. So that's one point. A second point is some follow-up work with some other IPC scientists on the state of carbon dioxide removal. We find that we need four to 10 gigatons by mid-century for net zero, and that we only get about half of it, looking at the IPCC scenarios, from the natural carbon solution. So there's about half of the problem that's not being solved by this uh, solution. And the third thing I'd say is just that if you look at other technologies, we heard of some of this already, it takes a while to scale up. And so there's urgency in terms of developing technologies. And so we need to be focusing on getting policy and getting action and getting MRV and all the other things we need to do. Uh, so it's puzzling to hear this comment, but I'm glad to think that response is actually uh, encouraging to hear what people You wanted to add something? Back Just to. very yeah. briefly, because I know we're on time. It's also, I want to go back to something Howard said at the beginning. All of the CO2 removal pathways have challenges. Mm -hmm. All of them do. That includes the nature-based pathways. And we've seen an awful lot of that this year, too. So, uh, and I'm not throwing shade or, or, or anything. We know we need the nature-based solutions in scale and abundance, but we need all the solutions in scale and abundance. I think that's, a, that's an interesting point. And, and before we get further into to that discussion, not to, to take for granted that everyone knows what all those solutions are. So I wonder if we could um, have a, like perhaps from Aaron a, a short sure. overview. We saw some slides um, before uh, outlining very briefly nature-based engineered solutions, but if you can walk us through a little bit what we're talking about. Sure, and Anki, you know this, but I just sprinted from the airport, so I missed those slides, so apologies <laughs> if I'm being repetitive. Um, so I will say at Carbon 180, we sort of at this point, think about them in three buckets. The engineered solution, so things like direct air capture, some you know, bioenergy pathways, you know, the work that CHARM is doing. Um, the second is the land-based pathway. So we're looking at forestry. We spend a lot of time on agroforestry, in particular carbon-180. We spend a lot of time on soil carbon. Um, but the third bucket that we think of is actually ocean carbon removal. Uh, and we're really excited about the potential there. They're engineered. They're, we don't love the term natural uh, carbon removal, in part because of exactly what Julio said. Uh, if we look at the impacts to communities, nature-based solutions have very serious impacts. And we don't want to just talk about something that is, um, you know, we, we don't want to uh, sort of assign value. We want to talk about the opportunities of all of these pathways. Um, and I would say across all of those, what's really exciting is that we're seeing new technologies. We're seeing new opportunities. And, and that includes in land base. We're seeing new information and new sort of ways to think about durability in soil carbon. We're looking at, you know, biotechnology and engineered biology. Um, you know, the, the ocean carbon removal space in particular, my colleague Dr. Si Feng Chen just put out our first ever uh, white paper on ocean carbon removal. There are tons of companies starting to scale up in the space. And so um, the, the last thing I'll say in this is um, to Julio's point too about trade-offs is 
um, if you're new to carbon removal or when I talk to reporters in the space, I always refer them. I need to remember the, the names of the students who made it, but there's a very simple online game called Road to 10 Gigatons. Mm -hmm. um, it's interactive and it's like a really great way if you haven't uh, spent a lot of time thinking about those trade-offs with carbon removal uh, to get in there, recognize we're going to need to scale massively and that just like Julio said, you've got benefits and trade-offs to all pathways. So what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of options at different level of maturity um, so far and the, the, the message that I'm hearing is that we'll need to work with all of them, but they also have some limitations, right? Um, which ones are you putting your, your bets on, let's say, that, that would be a driving force in this field? Who wants to take that? I, do, I would bet on a broad portfolio because all of them have limitations, and the scale is so tremendous. If we're talking about five to 10 gigatons a year or 400 gigatons over the rest of the century, any small issues are gonna become big issues, and you can mediate those issues by having a broad portfolio of bets. And some of them will learn, okay, the land use issues are just not acceptable and we'll have to switch gears. Or we'll try something else and say the energy intensity is just too much or the costs are too much or whatever it is. But that's why some experimentation is really helpful, some deployment in the field like we're actually seeing with DAC that we heard about this morning to learn about these issues, to learn about the biodiversity effects, all of them, but a broad portfolio at this point is really where we need to go. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, sorry, you so, wanted to add something? You know, Carbon Direct has voted with our feet. You know, we have a platform and we sell a portfolio in our platform, mm -hmm. and the portfolio includes nature-based and engineered pathways. There's a few that I think are going to prove to be big players in the market. Uh, Aforestation and reforestation is one of them. We're going to keep seeing that. It's going to keep being good. Biochar is coming on strong. Mm -hmm. uh, various forms of BECs, and I'm so pleased that we are now using the term bikers on a regular basis because, <laughs> you know, biomass carbon removal and storage. Biomass is not necessarily great energy, but it's great carbon removal. And so, not just charm, but also, again, this Ersted plant mm -hmm. uh, or Stockholm Exergy or these kinds of, of systems all look kind of interesting. I really believe that direct air capture is going to be huge. It, it is the backstop for all of this. It is the thing that we know we can deploy if we must. And I believe that things like mineralization and enhanced weathering are going to play big roles as well. For ocean removal, I'm optimistic, I'm interested. The challenges there are chiefly ones of things like monitoring, public acceptance, the London Convention of the Seas. <laughs> Is it legal to do it? These are a different class of questions, mm -hmm. but again, I could see those all playing a big role. One of the things that I, I wanna make sure is said in that context, on a gross level, these don't really compete with each other. Like Greg was saying, we know we need huge amounts of them. We need 10 gigatons right now. We're at tiny volumes. Like, we know we need to scale all of them. In point of fact, within the voluntary carbon market, they do compete. Mm -hmm. They compete on price. They compete on durability. They compete on time to contract. There's a number of other terms in the voluntary carbon market. And that has, uh, it is unclear how that will play out in the next, like, three years. It's easy to think about 2050. It's much harder to think about 2026. And so I do think we're going to see these different pathways competing for turf. I am hoping that we can all compete positively because we all know that we have to grow everything at incredible speed and scale to get to where we need to go. The other thing I would add quickly and, and sort of in the context of what we were talking about to, you know, with the UNFCCC is these are also, when we're talking about carbon removal, we're talking about something that largely is it's not creating a product, it's not creating energy you're not, it's going to cost something, that we're talking about a public good. And so, you know, obviously, Carbon 180 focuses on U.S. federal policy, and there are a number of reasons that that's true. But we're also not talking about these solutions scaling up and sort of, I don't even say a vacuum, just the, the market pieces that Julio's talking about, though those are important, is, you know, the U.S. just spent, you know, invested $3.5 billion in building four megaton director capture plants. The way that people, the UNFCCC, the way that federal policymakers, international policymakers understand and interact with carbon removal is going to be one of the biggest decision, like um, one, one of the biggest factors in deciding which of these is successful um, and if they are successful. And I think, you know, going back to standards, thinking about, you know, we use the term accountability a lot because we think about MRV, but how is MRV a t tool for accountability? My colleague Anu is going to talk about that later. And my colleague Ogbad is going to talk about our environmental justice work. And so I think all of these pieces when we're talking about 
what's going to scale and those trade-offs. We have to think really holistically and we have to be thoughtful in how we communicate to policymakers about it because, the, you know, again, that's going to be one of the biggest factors in, in how this scales. I just want to, that, that's very helpful for context, and, and I want to come back to this idea of a bit of, <clears throat> excuse me, what you're saying is going to be a competition for turf among these mm -hmm. technologies, and what you have said will be a broad portfolio of various um, kinds of technologies. I wonder if we can, like, do those kind of arguments go together, or do you see a little bit of a different perspective here? I mean, there may be something about the time frame, as mm. Julio said. In the near term, there's a lot of intense competition for capital, for policy support. Uh, but in the longer term, because of the scale, we're going to need a broad set of technologies. So, but I think there's a, if there is some convergence because of near-term cost advantages or other components that seem to be favorable, uh, it'll be helpful to have policy support for diversity because we want to have technological diversity and not pick a winner that looks low cost in the near term and put all our eggs in that basket. So preserving options for later is going to be an important part of the, the policy regime that's helpful here. Did you want to add something else? Yeah, yeah very much so. so uh, I think that the way that these, this competition will ultimately be managed and resolved is, in fact, through portfolios. Mm -hmm. We will end up combining these things as a function of cost and risk and speed and all these things. And already, our Carbon Direct, we see our customers are choosing different things. Some of our customers want 100% nature-based because that's what they want. Mm -hmm. Other customers want 100% engineered because that's what we want, they want. And the fact that already the market is beginning to differentiate on additionality, on durability, on environmental justice, and they're beginning to invest along those lines, I think, again, suggests that we are going to see ultimately these things working together and combining in different portfolios to get to market better and faster. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're, we're here to talk about carbon dioxide removal technologies particularly, but if we are to uh, zoom out a bit in a net zero world, which is the world that we are aspiring towards, what role, like what percentage would these technologies play compared to, let's say, emission mitigation, right, emission okay. reduction? Carbon Video. dioxide <laughs> removal is mitigation. Carbon dioxide removal is mitigation. It is not reduction. There's reduction and there's removals and there's avoidance. Those are different things, but they're all mitigation. To your question, we don't really know, honestly, mm -hmm. but the IPCC gives us numbers of 10 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. That's a very robust number. 10 or 20 percent is the irreducible fraction is the residual fraction. And one of the things I have to remind people is if we succeed at everything, if we succeed at efficiency and renewables and nuclear and electric vehicles and buildings and hydrogen, if we succeed at all of that, we will still need 10 gigatons. That's 20%. Like, it's, it is a huge number. And it's not because we hate those other things, it's just the arithmetic drives us to that outcome. Yeah, and I would say very specifically, you talked about net zero. We really focus, we're talking about net negative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, we focus not on carbon removal as a way to offset and to get to net zero, but as a way to address legacy emissions. You need all of those other things, like Julio said, but we've put yeah, too much CO2 in the atmosphere already. Um, Sasha, my colleague, sent me, I forget exactly the PPM, but hitting a new record, maybe there's a story yet. 424, uh, we have too much CO2 in the atmosphere. We got to pull it out. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, no, just to I agree, it's 10 to 20%. I mean, the, the, where those numbers come from, we're doing 40 today. We need to get to net zero. And so that means four to eight is going to be negative in 2050. That's, it's pretty simple math that way. But it also means, you know, one of the first things I say when I talk about carbon dioxide removal is near term urgency is to reduce emissions because that. 80% or 90% of the problem, that's a really urgent imperative. And so those go together. And so when we start to talk about moral hazard or CDR taking away from emissions reductions, that's not the way to think about it. And I really hope people don't think about it that way because we really need both. Okay, right. so, so but, but that gets to what Howard said. He, in his talk, he said, the best way to reduce, pull CO2 out of the air is to not emit it. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. we are all enthusiasts. But then, yeah. but then Greg already uh, made a mention of the moral hazard, so maybe now it's a good time to, to tackle <laughs> that one as well. Um, so one, of, and I know you, you want to say things about that. Um, so we are, when we are, the, the moral hazard um, argument is the, the people who are against the, these technologies that we're discussing here today are, are afraid, let's say, that it will offer like a, a blank check for the 
uh, fossil fuel industry to keep emitting. And it's, it's important to just like unpack a little bit that also because there needs to be a response to those concerns. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what your take is on that. And we'll start with Julio because I know that uh, you have a strong opinion. Yes. <laughs> so I, I don't even know where to begin. I could take 10 hours talking about why I disagree with the moral hazard perspective. Um, at its heart, it basically says you can't trust humans. They are too stupid to do the right thing, so we're going to tell them what the right thing is to do. I don't believe any aspect of that. It also ignores the arithmetic. We must do this. That's the math. Um, I also don't think that CO2 removal in any way, shape, or form is business as usual. It's the opposite of business as usual. You're saying I'm taking stewardship of our emissions, and we're paying a very large amount of money to manage it. Um, and, and so, so sort of every aspect of it doesn't add up to me. Uh, it is easy to say, if you do this stupid thing stupidly, it will be stupid. And that's at the core of the moral hazard argument, and I simply can't agree. We just need, and, and I believe we're already in a post-moral hazard world. The moral hazard people slowed down deployment of point source capture for 20 years. They slowed down the deployment of adaptation investment for 10 years. They're slowing this down now. They have a zero percent record of success, hmm. and they don't speak for anybody, as near as I can tell. They don't speak for the global south. They don't speak for Eastern Europe. They don't speak for the Americas. I don't know who they speak for or claim to speak for. Erin, what's your, how, do, how would you address them? Because, you know. Sure. I think it's a totally, I mean, I, I guess I pretty strongly disagree with Julio in that. Um, I think it's a totally fair concern to have that people are going to do this poorly. Um, and I think for most people, this is a, you know, carbon removal is relatively a new, con you know, when we're talking again in the U.S. Po context, it's relatively new to them. And they're seeing a couple of groups talk about it when they're talking about oil and gas companies, not the most climate forward folks. They're hearing it from U.S. federal policymakers who are sometimes talking about this as a way to continue burning fossil fuels. There are policymakers, senators who are saying that. And so mm -hmm. to say that there's no basis for that concern, I think, is untrue. Um, but I do think that there is an opportunity to build trust with those folks. Now, look, if we break it down who they're talking for, you know, look, there are going to be some actors who I think are probably not um, particularly genuine, who have different theories of change, who are, their whole goal is to shut down carbon removal, and they're gonna use a moral hazard argument, and it's, it's not a, a genuine concern that they have, it's just a tactic, and that's not who we work with. But I will say, the work that we've done with, say, environmental justice organizations, who very understandably are extremely concerned about how carbon removal might be deployed in their communities, how it might slow down uh, uh, reductions, uh, efforts, um, and the impacts that climate is already having on their communities, I, when we talk to them, a lot of that is building trust around sharing those values, understanding that. Again, the work that my colleague Ugbad, our director of environmental justice, has led with her team, and it's been really successful. So I think that the other thing that I would disagree with uh, Julio on is the sort of, and it depends on the audience, but the approach. You know, I think for us it's been sort of starting from a place of listening with environmental justice organizations in particular to say, you know, like, what's going on? Like, why are you concerned about this? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what our goals here are because I think that they're pretty shared. And, um, and I think the other thing has been changing how we think about carbon removal. I think we would have had a different answer at Carbon 180 um, before UGBA came on and ran our started our environmental justice work. Um, and the outcome of that has been environmental justice organizations who are extremely excited about carbon removal. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not extremely, let me say, they're enthusiastic right. about carbon removal. Um, and, but in particular, we're seeing some of the environmental justice organizations that we work with go from saying, you know, I'm interested in soil carbon removal, I don't want to talk to carbon removal, to saying, you know, I'm actually really interested in director capture. Can we talk about what that would look like in my community? So again, there are certainly actors who are not mm -hmm. serious about that. But I also think it's, I don't know, to say, it's not a real concern to that, you know. Well, but I didn't say that. And I want to be really clear about this. There, there are legitimate concerns that many groups might have about the deployment of carbon removal. Okay. That is not the same thing as the moral hazard argument. It's really, the moral hazard argument is the existence of Diet Coke means nobody will lose weight. It just, that, that, but in fact, there are going to be real questions, and I agree with everything you said, actually. 
that the, the legitimate concerns that communities have, that actors have, that politicians may misrepresent aspects of it, I think that's all genuine and accurate. Well, if I may, I think one of the main differences between you two is that you're saying even if there are not very legitimate concerns, you would still be listening, right, to understand what, what mm. they're worried about or try to find the messaging to... Yeah, and look, we have we work with different audiences, but certainly when we work with environmental justice organizations, it comes from a place of, you know, starting with shared values and understanding that the... <clears throat> The experience they have with climate change, the experience they have with extraction industries is extremely different than ours. I mean, you know, I just flew to Zurich. I'm sitting in this beautiful place. I talk to members of Congress. You know, I have, uh, you know, all of this access to power and change, and I have this ability to, like, you know, make uh, big decisions for my family and what my life looks like. And I think starting from that place of understanding that our job in the carbon removal space, if we want to get to what is good carbon removal, not just carbon removal at scale, not just 10 gigatons, but 10 good gigatons, highly accountable, equitable and just, uh, focused on legacy emissions, that, that takes a lot of reflection for the carbon removal sector, where I think a lot of times, and I saw this in the point source side, I think we can think of ourselves as the underdogs or mm. the little guys in the room because you know we have to fight for attention or the UNFCCC is saying something negative about our work. But uh, in reality, I think that that's not the power dynamic at all. We can probably keep talking about the moral uh, hazard argument for a while, but I want to jump to Greg um, and shift a little bit. Um, one of the, the topics that came up um, also earlier today was the issue of cost. And I know that you wrote a book kind of tracing or tracking a little bit how the costs for solar PV have come down. What have you learned there that you think will be applicable in, in this situation? Yeah, the cost question. I mean, I like the way Howard put it um, this morning is just that we don't know what the cost will be. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're completely ignorant mm -hmm. about what cost will be. And one of the basis of evidence that we can use for an emerging technology that hasn't been really developed at megaton or gigaton scale yet is historical analogs. And things like solar give you an analog because, okay, solar's grown at 30% a year for more than 30 years and above 30% the last couple of years. And if we need to get, say, direct air capture to a gigaton a year by 2050, that's scaling up about 40% a year. So taking what we've done with solar and going a little bit faster but in the same ballpark, and then, but not as fast as what we're doing with electric vehicles, that's even mm. faster. And so we're kind of in between where we need to be with those two. But then you can look at these previous technologies and say not just how fast did they go, but how did they grow so quickly and how did the cost come down? And that's where things that come up, we heard this uh, word several times this morning, iteration. Having lots of chances for learning by doing, to improve, to change processes, to look at what's happening and to change it. It's a lot easier to do that with a small modular design where you have many, many units and many, many iterations than doing say, a million ton a year of plants, and you only do a few of those and see how big you can get with those. There's just more chances to improve, and if we're gonna take solar or wind or electric vehicles as an analog, that's the kind of processes that we need to look at. And that involves standardization, equipment that you develop specifically for making these plants, developing infrastructure, developing supply chains, you heard about that all too. So that's not a 2023 problem, that's 2023 to 2030 something, but that's what worked with solar, and if we're gonna do something similar with direct air capture, that's what we need to look at. On the other hand, if you're going to go big, then you need other models, and I have a postdoc, and we've been looking at analogs for really large-scale direct air capture, and the one that we've come up with that seems to tick all the boxes is quite similar is an old one, and that's ammonia synthesis, mm. is creating ammonia for fertilizer and for munitions. That was something that happened over 100 years in the 20th century, but also grew at a rate that if direct air capture grew at that rate, would also get you gigaton by 2050. And there it's things like system integration, really strong policy support, and making it a national priority, which it was for ammonia synthesis. So we've got different models to use. Small modular has gone quickly, like solar and wind and electric vehicles, but then we have large system integration intensive that have also been able to scale, but they use different techniques for that. So we've got a couple directions to go. Yeah, and the research is ongoing as well. Ongoing, yeah. yeah, all, yeah. So before, by the way, we're gonna open for questions very soon, um, so think of them. Uh, but before we move to that, just wanna get you, uh, all of you to reflect in maybe just a few words, max one sentence, um, of what do you think needs to happen in the next year, so just very short term, one year, 
um, to, to see even more momentum, to see more development in this industry? Greg, we'll start with you and come this way. Okay, yeah, I would say just keep it short, experimentation across a broad portfolio and developing many different ways with technology to do monitoring, reporting, and verification. I would say those are priorities that in a year from now, if we're seeing a lot of progress on that, I'd be very encouraged. In the longer term, it's about expectations that there'll be this rising and growing demand. That has been crucial for electric vehicles and solar and these other things that have grown. Expectations are crucial. And then at some point, not now, but in maybe 10 years, convergence on a dominant design. So we start building a lot of the same things because we know they work and they're reliable, and then we really can get the costs out. And Jan's curve that showed costs going up and then starting to come down, that convergence section is where you start to really go down. And so that's beyond a year, but that's coming up. So you give me a year, medium term and long term. Yeah. <laughs> but just one year, what do you think would be important? Um, really strong standards and the beginning of big infrastructure investments. Got it. Julio? Buyers. Buyers. There's not enough buyers. And frankly, if in the next year we can get a handful of governments, like the US government or the Canadian government or the European Union, to buy CO2 removal as a service, that would go a very long way towards deployment. Got it. So buyers. So now um, Hannah is going to come back on stage, and we're going to take some questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Indy. That was really interesting. Do we have any questions uh, to start in the room? Yes, if we can just bring a microphone uh, to you here. It's just coming along your left-hand side. And that makes sure that uh, everyone joining us online can actually hear your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Axel Michaelova from Perspectives and University of Zurich. My question relates to ocean removals. We've seen certain carbon cowboys trying ocean removals more than 10 years ago on the Canadian West Coast that contaminated the whole field and led to the London Convention, London Protocol essentially prohibiting it. Now we see all these starts up, startups that don't consider this regulatory environment. And Julio, you mentioned it. How do you think we can overcome this problem? Who would like to take that? Maybe Erin, because... Uh, my quick answer is my colleague, again, Dr. Feng Chen, has a paper, carbon180.org, um, talking exactly about what, what's needed for responsible ocean carbon removal deployment. I do think that small-scale trials, you know, again, we're focused on the US, but more proactive regulatory work uh, through the Environmental Protection Agency at the US, more coordination at an international level, and starting small-scale trials. But I think you need to build up that policy infrastructure quick, because folks are moving forward. Yeah, Axel, to your point, I, I, first of all, I agree with that. Second, I, I agree that small-scale pilots managed would help. If you know something, that will go a long way. At heart, people love the ocean. There's a deep personal connection to the ocean and human beings. And we tried this 20 years ago, and the response we got back overwhelmingly was, we've screwed up the air. Do you want to fix it by screwing up the ocean? And we better have a better answer for that before we start deploying. Thank you. Do Thank we you have very much. Any other questions here in the room? Yes, we have one in the middle towards the back, down the center aisle. Thank you very much. Just wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, Nicholas Seisenberger, Global Thermostat. Uh, I just want to first thank Jan and Christoph for hosting us again. This is just amazing to see all these people talking about this. Um, Julio, I happen to agree with you 100% on your point about buyers being top priority for the near term. Um, can you elaborate uh, for the rest of us why you think um, in the position that you sit, not in a direct air capture company, but in looking at the broad uh, marketplace mm -hmm. and its ev evolution, why you isolated buyers as your top priority? Uh, happy to. Uh, let's start by the fact that I was schooled years ago by uh, Mr. Wurzbacher and Mr. Gebald who basically said the only thing we lack is customers. If we had customers, we could build faster. Um, in point of fact, in our business in Carbon Direct, uh, this is the point. Broadly, there's no supply, there's no demand, there's no transparency, there's no market, there's no contracting. Other than that, it's perfect, right? So uh, the, the challenge, though, is the rate-limiting step is actually demand. There are companies that want to build. There are projects that want to deploy. They need a firm offtake before they can go to the bank. And it's hard to get a 10-year offtake for 100,000 tons a year. It's just hard to get that. 
It's part of the reason why I'm so enthusiastic, and, and Aaron uh, and Carbon 180 have been leading in this arena for a long time, why I think government procurement will prove to be an essential piece. All, all, all important technology over human history has scaled through government procurement. Mm. Doesn't matter whether it's semiconductors and flat screen TVs, in energy it's LEDs, it's batteries, it's solar panels, wind farms, nuclear plants, all of these were bought by governments. The idea that somehow this can be birthed Athena-like into the world without buyers of that scale and commitment is, I think, hard to believe. Thank you very much indeed. I, I would like to get to some of the questions that have been sent online um, as well today. And quite an interesting one. I mean, you were talking earlier about all the battles that are being fought and won all the time, but what about the more internal battles within uh, the industry uh, on the, the importance of standards? Do you see fault lines, for example, emerging between the CDR communities on the question of, you know, say, for example, how we define high quality or, or permanence, and how do we ensure that we maintain the ultimate goal, which is, of course, um, trying to fight climate change? Maybe, Greg, you could Yeah, start. I mean, I think it's time for a robust discussion about that. I think we're appreciating that these technologies work so differently, and they're measured so differently. The oceans, the, you know, agriculture or forest-based solutions, and the uh, machine solutions, all of them have different elements that require life cycle analysis of some sort and accounting for time and, and potentially accounting for the liability that happens when a removal no longer is stable and there. And so people have talked about a carbon central bank to account for some of that. And so, yeah, it's a time to come up with technologies, which U.S. Department of Energy is working on for sensing fluxes of carbon and storage, and then also thinking about policies that can create the right incentives for that, because we're appreciating that these technologies are quite diverse in how they function and, and where the carbon goes and, and how much it stays. Well, I certainly hope we have some of that discussion, or at least start that discussion here today. Yeah. Just one final question in the last minute or so. Um, in order for direct air capture to truly reduce atmospheric CO2 concentration, it can't just be used as an offset. Any idea of who actually pays for direct air capture in a scenario when it truly reduces atmospheric CO2 concentration and not just used as an offset. I know many of the partners here at Climeworks already do that, but you know, is, the, is there a real understanding you know, between the differences of, you know, offsetting and really, you know, reducing the historical. Yep, so but I, I want to hear what Aaron says in just a second. First of all, we at Carbon Direct, we do not use the word offset ever, ever. It's carbon avoidance, carbon reduction, carbon removal. Those are the services that are provided in this space. When you call things an offset, it rather deliberately conflates these things. So keep the services separately. If you're talking about CO2 removal purchases as a service, Right now, that's being done by the voluntary market. I think fundamentally for this to scale, it will have to move to a compliance market. And in fact, in Canada, they are developing these exact standards for compliance with their $170 a ton carbon tax. Mm. And they are trying to create a pathway that car direct air capture is, and they are making a standard for direct air capture, for BECs, they're doing these different things, just like Greg was saying. Those standards, that clarity as a compliance mechanism with the carbon tax is in fact a way to, to move that market and scale it? I don't think there's a great understanding about the need for this mm -hmm. to be, in, in our perspective, almost entirely focused on legacy emissions. And I think that even when there is a bit of that distinction between, um, you know, functioning as an offset or, uh, you know, allowing the continued use of fossil fuels or addressing legacy emissions that a lot of folks are really talking about this as, you know, unfortunately still, at least in the U.S. context, um, as something that's going to allow us to continue to emit fossil fuels. As we all know, looking at the climate math, that's just not the case. Okay, super. Thank you all so much for your insights. Obviously, still a long way to go on many fronts. Um, we'll be digging into uh, standardization within the industry next, so I think that's an appropriate topic for us to jump to. We'll be back at the top of the hour. Uh, for now, though, it's time for a much-earned coffee break, networking, and collaboration. Enjoy.